Uh, another case here. Uh, this one not quite so exotic. We've got um, this is a half of a of a nodule, and it was a popliteal mass in a in an adult woman, uh, several centimeters, and it was down in the deep soft tissue. And most of the time, you these uh, these lesions do arise in deeper soft tissue, but they can occur in skin. So I think it's important to to be aware of them as a dermatopathologist. For one thing, I'll point from low power. We've got a thick capsule around the outside and a very sharp circumscription. This lesion basically popped out, shelled out away from the adjacent tissue. You can see right away, and if you have experience at all with this, you probably already know the diagnosis because with practice at low power, these are very distinct hypercellular zone and hypocellular zone. So this is a schwannoma, Antony A, Antony B is the loose areas that look myxoid or edematous or almost like a kind of sometimes they can look like neurofibroma. You often have dilated vessels in schwannoma, usually with perivascular hyalinization. Um, this one doesn't really have a particularly much hyalinization um, or fibrin around the vessels, but you do see leaking blood. Extravasated erythrocytes and hemorrhage and hemosiderin are very common in schwannoma. Uh, really useful to be aware of that. And I, you may notice, why is he not mentioning, Anto I mean, AVERIC bodies? I will get there in a minute, I promise. But it, just like I talked to you about with uh, in the uh, lecture number two, I think it was, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, sometimes it doesn't have giant cells, so we have to learn all the other more subtle features for those cases that don't have the giant cells. The same thing goes with schwannomas. Sometimes the palisading is very subtle or maybe even absent, especially if you if you you know get a needle biopsy of a deep soft tissue or retroperitoneal schwannoma, which I know is not a derm path problem, but the point is is that sometimes the characteristic feature of the, the varicay body that everyone knows and loves will not be there for you to help you. And in those cases, you must know the other features. Okay. Once you think of schwannoma, it's easy. You do it S100 or SOX10. It's wall to wall, you know, level 11 positivity on the on the amplifier or or four plus positivity, whatever you like. But uh, recognizing Antony A and B, the capsule, the the dilated vessels, often with sclerosis around them, and then you can go and look in the hypercellular zones and see if you find varicay bodies. And in this case, we don't really have any good varicay bodies, but what we do have is some vague nuclear palisading. Now, I don't know uh, what you guys will think about this, but I know a lot of my trainees, I'm like, look, see how these cells are lining up right here? And right here, they're lining up. And right here, they're like palisades. And my trainees are always like, ugh. And they think I'm hallucinating, which it's possible. After, you know, you could drink, drink the Kool-Aid for so long and you come to believe the things that you're hallucinating on the slide if you're not careful. I mean, I'm only kind of joking. It's also partially true. So I, I actually learn a lot from the things that I, I think are useful that I tell my trainees and they don't really catch it. That tells me that either I'm wrong about it or it's only something that works for my mind or it's a subtlety that I need to find a way to make more clear when I'm teaching. So I actually love, I, that's one of the things I love about teaching is that the points of misunderstanding or even the times, especially when junior people just starting out, when they think something looks like something else and they get it confused, two entities confused that I would never have thought looked alike, then I realized, oh, I guess those could look like each other. And I love that because I've learned so many things uh, from those types of, of uh, confusions that I wouldn't have thought of, but that an earlier trainee could, could get confused about and it helps me. So um, I will show you more about the palisades in one moment, but I also want to point out the scattered, sorry again about that, scattered hyperchromatic pleomorphic cells scattered throughout. So this is a, a common finding schwannomas and other nerve sheath tumors often have. In schwannomas, I would say even they usually have scattered atypia, or as my, as my residency program director, Suzanne Powell, who's a neuropathologist, she liked to say random pleomorphism, just random scattered pleomorphic cells. Um, usually, though, very few mitoses. There are some exceptions, um, but usually uh, mitotic activity is, is not uh, robust. You may find occasional mitoses here and there, uh, but uh, especially if there's areas of inflammation and hemorrhage, I see, I see mitoses around that sometimes. But scattered atypia is just fine in a schwannoma, and it kind of is true of all nerve sheath tumors, that this random kind of what we think of as ancient change or degenerative atypia, uh, just like you can see random uh, degenerative atypia in nevi. It's the same kind of phenomenon. It's just really common in schwannomas. And sometimes, particularly in big schwannomas, and the thought is maybe schwannomas that have been present for a long time, that they get more of this, thus the idea of so-called ancient change that you can see a lot of scattered pleomorphic cells like here. We have a lot of hyperchromatic, smudgy, big nuclei scattered throughout, 
but all of the other normal features of schwannoma are still there. And sometimes, particularly like in the retroperitoneum, uh, you can begin to get cystic change and you can get a lot of sclerotic collagen and, and really hypocellular. And those, uh, those are like the, the true ancient schwannomas that have all of the burned out sclerotic, you know, scarred up kind of look plus atypia. And those sometimes the, uh, the schwannoma, the classic schwannoma features can be pretty subtle because they're all kind of wiped out by sclerosis. I feel like that more often happens like in the retroperitoneum. And I don't know that I've seen that really dramatically in the skin. But just know that pleomorphism in a schwannoma is totally fine. Do not be afraid. If you start seeing a lot of mitoses, then maybe stop and ask yourself, am I sure the other features of schwannoma are there? Could this be something else that I'm, that I'm missing? And I, you know, usually a schwannoma is an H&E diagnosis in my opinion, but there's no harm whatsoever if you need confirmation to do a SOX 10 or an S100, which should be strong diffuse positive in the majority of cells. Okay, unlike a neurofibroma, which is a mixture of Schwann cells, fibroblasts, perineural cells, and thus only a, a subset of the cells will stain if you look closely. Uh, with S100 and, and SOX10, it's not staining every cell, it's just staining, you know, half of them or so. Uh, it depends on e each neurofibroma is different. But schwannomas are not that way. They are composed essentially entirely of Schwann cells, although they may sometimes have histiocytes or inflammatory cells mixed in. But, you know, the vast majority of the cells that we're seeing here will be strongly positive for um, for SOX10 and S100. So you can use that to help in uh, difficult cases. So the palisading is here, but it's quite uh, subtle. So let me show you. I took some screenshots from this case and I marked these up for the purposes of posting online uh, just uh, yesterday actually. So this is good timing. And I, what I wanted to show here is here's a screenshot and you can see the A for Antoni A, the hypercellular areas are Antoni A and that's where varicae bodies and palisading usually are because you need to have cells to make a varicae body and varicae rhymes with A. So that's how I learned it in memorizing in med school and I still find it a useful way to think of it. And B is the loose kind of myxoid or edematous or neurofibroma looking areas. But these lines are flanking areas that to my eye look like palisades. They're, they are not always straight lines that are perfectly parallel. They sometimes curve, they're sometimes kind of tortuous or serpentine, and they're subtle. Sometimes it's just kind of a vague clustering with adjacent areas that are pink and hypocellular. So I'm gonna show you this, and now I'm gonna show you the same picture without the lines and see if you can see it. Can you appreciate how those lined up nuclei are there? And over here, it's a little more subtle, but with practice, I think you can begin to see going back and forth. Oh yeah, there is kind of a line of cells right down here and right down here. And they don't always orient the same direction. They don't always look beautiful. They're not as pretty as varicae bodies. People don't always take pictures of this kind of stuff and put in a textbook because why would you do that if you can get a gorgeous varicae body, one of the most lovely looking structures in uh, human neoplasia and benign too. So in any case, I know this is not as aesthetically pleasing, but recognizing the subtle palisades is really helpful, not only for schwannoma, but, but for other tumors that palisade as well, like spindle cell lipoma and related entities in the RB1 loss uh, kind of quote family of tumors and, and more. There are other tumors that have vague palisading and seeing that vague palisade can really help you make the diagnosis. So here's the marked up view. And here's the view that's not marked up. And this is on Kiko. You can see the, the post uh, URL up here, or you can go look it up um, in, my, uh, in my index. So um, in any case, there's Palisades there. And this is just showing Antoni A and B and then without the annotation. So I hope you find that useful. And then let me make this a little bit more relevant for skin. Here's actually a schwannoma in the skin. And I'll tell you this, that I've seen a lot of schwannomas, but I do not often see schwannomas in the dermis or even the subcutis, to be quite honest. When I see them in the, near the skin, they are almost always centered in the subcutis like this and maybe pushing up into the dermis. I can count on one hand the number of purely intradermal schwannomas I have ever seen in a, a soft tissue fellowship and 10 years of practicing as a derm path and soft tissue pathologist. Schwannomas are exceptionally rare in the dermis. So uh, just to know that if you think that something's a schwannoma and it looks like a schwannoma kind of, and it's in the dermis only, it could be, but the much more likely thing is it's a palisaded encapsulated neuroma, which would be this right here. 
And uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but let me just show you this case first. You can see here there's cystic change, hemorrhage, hypercellular and hypocellular areas, a nice capsule, all the stuff that I told you. The capsule is actually, if you did a stain for perineurial marker like EMA or GLUT1 or Claudin1, usually there is perineuria mixed with fibrosis. That's what makes the capsule. Because schwannomas arise inside of a small or a large nerve. They, they arise in a nerve and then grow and push their way outward and the, cap, the perineurium expands and then fibrosis and creates the capsule. That's kind of the idea of how this works. And so you'll often find multi-layered perineurial cells in the capsule of a schwannoma. At least most of the times when I, I don't usually do those stains routinely, but I've done it for teaching and it usually works pretty nicely. So just be aware of that. And there's, there's a little nicer varicae bodies here. They're not perfect still, but they're pretty good. And then look at the fibrin and the sclerosis around the dilated vessels. That is super helpful for schwannoma. And I know the last case, the big case didn't have it, but it, it's, it's present in most schwannomas to some degree. So I find the sclerotic and or perivascular fibrin to be really helpful. Sometimes you get weird, bizarre changes, a reactive change, I, I believe, of the endothelial cells in these vessels too. And it can look really weird. And the pericytes around them can look kind of weird too. And here's a better look at those, kind of a cluster of varicae bodies. They're all clumped up together. Um, uh, and so this is nice classic schwannoma now and a good, a good rare example that's occurring near the skin. All right, now just briefly, palisaded and encapsulated neuroma or solitary circumscribed neuroma. Despite the name, it's not usually beautifully encapsulated. It is often circumscribed, agree, but it doesn't usually have a capsule like that or like that, okay? So that's one thing. It's usually centered in the dermis. It sometimes can be multinodular or plexiform. Plexiform palisade encapsulated neuroma is a, a well-described variant, and it's important to not confuse that with plexiform neurofibroma, which of course uh, is basically sine qua non for, um, uh, for neurofibromatosis type one. And plexiform palisade encapsulated neuroma has no association with NF1, although this weird, bizarre thing about it, it has been reported at least a few times. If you have a plexiform palisade encapsulated neuroma in the hand, the acral skin, um, is sometimes associated with Cowden syndrome. So I have seen, I think, two different patients that were kids that had that, and I, I never did get the follow-up, but I recommended that they uh, get a genetic counseling just to make sure there was no other signs of Cowden syndrome. Uh, kind of an unusual, weird thing. Uh, palisade encapsulated neuroma is usually on the face, but in the times I see them off of the face, the next most common site I see palisade encapsulated neuroma is the acral skin, usually the fingers. So kind of strange, I don't know why that happens. I wouldn't have called this one plexiform personally. I mean, it does branch a little, but I would have just called this palisade encapsulated neuroma. The main difference here the, the, from schwannoma is the capsule, for one thing, like we said, is not really there. And even though there's palisading, it's usually much more vague and, and kind of not like nice varicade bodies. Although, like I just told you, schwannomas sometimes don't have that, the beautiful varicade bodies. And the best thing is these crack-like clefting artifact around these fascicles of spindle Schwann cells. So that's a really helpful thing. And if you really want, you can do like a neurofilament stain and there tend to be more neurofilament components present in these neuromas uh, and less in a schwannoma, but it's not a perfect way to tell them apart. I think Chris Fletcher did a study on that back in the the early 90s, if I recall, and found that it's not like really 100%. Schwannomas, for one thing, can get neural uh, nerve twigs entrapped in them because they arise from a nerve, and so sometimes they kind of pull along some of those little nerve bundles and branches, and so you can have some areas with some neurofilament. And I've also seen some of these that didn't have very abundant neurofilament in the in the uh, palisade encapsulated neuroma. So I don't routinely do it. It also doesn't usually matter, right? Schwannoma of the skin versus palisade encapsulated neuroma. But I'll just tell you, junior, junior people watching this who may have to take a test one day, if you think it's a dermal schwannoma on a test, the answer should that you should guess is palisade encapsulated neuroma, okay? Because dermal schwannoma is really, really, really rare. So there you go. You can see kind of vague palisades down there. And there's the nice clefting uh, artifact. And uh, seeing these wrap around a nerve, a normal nerve, perineural growth is totally fine. It's not perineural invasion. It's just arising from the nerve because it's a nerve sheath tumor. And nerve sheath tumors are allowed to be wrapped around nerves and coming off of nerves because that's what they grow from. So I hope you enjoyed uh, that discussion. I really enjoy nerve sheath tumors.